So our series is titled, This Is Us, and we are looking at, okay, Churches of Christ, DNA, who are we, how do we live, how do we act, why do we do what we do. Um, some of you, as we talked about last week or two weeks ago, grew up in Churches of Christ. Some of you have not. Um, and so I think this will be helpful for all of us and all of us in between that. Um, last week, we talked about the main kind of move or uh, emphasis in Church of Christ early on, which was unity. Okay, so that's probably one of the main pillars of our tradition is unity. The other one that I wanted to talk about this morning is scripture. Okay, and so um, these first couple of weeks, we're doing very big, broad strokes of, you know, who we are and what we're about, and then eventually we'll get into some more smaller, dicey things, so uh, just bear with us as we kind of go through some of this early on broad stuff. And so, um, not only do I want to look at who we are, but I want to look at how, how Scripture has shaped us. So let, let me ask you this question. If I asked you this question, how do you read Scripture? So how do you read the Bible? What would your answer be? Carefully, okay. Huh? Out loud, okay. It's kind of an unfair question, right? Because um, some of us may say, uh, I just read it, right? Um, but to be honest and to be frank with you, that, that's, we take that question for granted. Um, there were a thousand plus years in Christian history where people did not read Scripture, okay? So if we chose to villainize, for example, the Catholic Church, we may say, well, there was a thousand plus years there where they were trying to control and keep the Bible excluded from others. And I don't know if that's true. Uh, um, I mean, there might be some truth to that. But the reality is, is, especially during the Middle Ages and during that long period of time, there was a high, high rate of illiteracy. People just couldn't read. And not only could people not read, but they especially couldn't read what the Bible was written in. And that language was, most people, you know what the language the Bible was written in? Latin, right? So originally Greek and Hebrew and all that, but it was translated, orig the original vernacular was Latin. And people didn't read Latin, and people just didn't read at all. Okay? So not only that, but how, did, how were Bibles created way, way back then? They had to handwrite them, right? So do you know how thick the Bible is and how many words are there? A lot. And writing was an art. And writing, um, if you would go back and look at some of these ancient Bibles, they are beautiful and they are written. How long or how much do you think that costs to write a Bible? A lot. So not only was Bibles in, um, accessible because of language, but they're also inaccessible, inaccessible because of cost. And then not only was um, it just difficult to gain access to Bible because of reading and because of the cost of Scripture. And these Bibles were huge, by the way. I mean, they were massive Bibles. They were often chained um, because something that's really expensive in a church building, yes, could go missing. Um, and so they chained them, and so they just kind of centered there. And to be fair to the Catholic tradition, um, the way they view Scripture is different than we do. See, uh, let me, this is oversimplifying, I get it, but we would say Scripture informs the church, right? So we would say Scripture informs how the church lives and acts, believes, and all that. What they say is, uh, is that the church has shaped or informed Scripture. Now, their argument is, is, guess who are the ones who compiled and created the Bible? The church, right? So the Bible didn't just come out of nowhere. That's not our tradition. We don't believe that um, the Bible came out of nowhere um, and dug it up out of a ground and gold plates. We believe that somebody at some point or a bunch of human beings got together in a room and said, this makes it and this doesn't. Right? And that happened a few hundred years after Jesus. Um, and so, um, that's their argument. Okay, So that's another reason. And, and it's not that they don't believe in the Bible, but their worship, their center was not Scripture. Their worship and their center was the Eucharist or the Mass. Right, So when you go to a church service in Catholic, they call it Mass because they're centering their entire worship on the Lord's Supper. 
right? And that's essentially what the main priestly duty is, is to serve the Lord's Supper. There might be some speaking, there's going to be some reading, but the whole point of why you're coming together is to break bread and drink cup, right? Where in our tradition, you know, even our building, this room, we call this room the auditorium, right? An auditorium is auditory. Even in our space, we have configured our space more about listening to God's word, right? What's, what's the longest part of our worship service? Preaching, right? It's speaking, it's hearing God's word. Um, and so, uh, again, it's just a different way. Not that Lord's Supper. We're a little different in the free church movement, like Baptist stuff, where we do practice regular practices like the Lord's Supper and and things like that. So we might be a little different than a lot. But even for us, um, we might want to say the center of us is Lord's Supper. But the truth is we put a lot of emphasis in the hearing of God's word. Okay, um, So I'm setting that up to say to not villainize a time period. To say that people what were they were because of why and experience and culture and history. Okay, So eventually though... A couple of big movements come out, and after the Middle Ages, you have things like the Renaissance period, and you have the rise of discovery, the rise of art, and the, this is really a time when human, human beings started thinking, you know what, I can actually think for myself, I can actually make a life for myself, I can, I can do things, I can be innovative, and I can, I can create, and so there was this new like, idea that each human being mattered. And that you can make a name for yourself. And so you have that in the Renaissance period. And then you have another era right around the same time called the Enlightenment period. Where finally people, this is called the age of reasoning. People started thinking scientifically, linear thinking. We started moving away from a superstitious society. In all of these types of things, people thinking scientifically, people thinking for themselves... All of a sudden, you've got all these new innovations. All of this helped catapult us out of kind of a dark middle age to a more advanced society. And as an advanced society, some big inventions happened. One big one in particular that really changed Christianity, and that was the printing press. The printing press. Why would the Gutenberg printing press change Christianity? What? God's printed word for the masses. All of a sudden, the Bible is no longer expensive. It's no longer chained in a church building. All of a sudden, people have access to Scripture. So you marry that with now people believe they can think for themselves, and there's reasoning. People start, all different types of people start reading and engaging God's word, and now people start taking a step back and going, huh, I don't know if I agree with the one church, and especially its institution. And so early founders of what we call the Reformation period didn't necessarily want to break away from the Catholic Church, but they definitely wanted to challenge what the Catholic Church was teaching. So uh, one person in particular named Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on a wall. That's like one of the main stories that kind of, kind of shapes Protestantism, right? Protesting uh, the Catholic Church. And then you have others, not just him, but you have John Calvin. You might have heard of his name. One of my favorite names to say in the uh, Reformation movement, just because it's fun to say, is Ulrich Zwingli. Um, out of Switzerland, he was another major shaker and mover in the Reformation movement. So all of them started saying that we can read the Bible, and the Bible is, shapes people. That, that Bible is what shapes God's people. And so from there, you have Protestant traditions um, in, in, the, um, in Europe, uh, especially. So at the heart of Europe, you've got like kind of a Lutheran movement. You have this small movement called the Anabaptist movement. Not, a, not necessarily associated with the Baptists. Uh, you have other congregational movements in England. You have the Church of England or Anglican, who eventually the United States become the Episcopalians. Then you have other sub-movements that are even challenging these bigger movements. Like in England, you don't just have the Church of England, but you also have more smaller Reformed traditions or the Puritans. Uh, that's where we get the story of the pilgrims. And so all these uh, traditions starts coming out of Europe, and they have all these ideas about what the Bible is saying. And then they take all of that and we move to the United States. 
Okay, so we jump ahead, and again, it goes back to the Campbells. You have America, you're on democracy, frontier, freedom of choice, and, and uh, you can make a name for yourself. And uh, one thing that really shaped how we read Scripture was what we call the common man era in America's history. And the best way to describe it was President Andrew Jackson, about 1830s-ish, I don't remember the exact time, but he actually came from the hum a very humbled, poor background. And he was like the first president really to do so. And so in that, there is this message to America that people from like impoverished or lower uh, backgrounds, not just the rich aristocrats, you can actually become somebody. And so that even shaped how we as Churches of Christ people say, well, we're the priesthood of all believers. Anybody can have access to Scripture. Anybody can read it. All of us can figure out what it has to say for ourselves. Okay, so top that with Alexander Camel and Barton Stone and them. They're tired of disunity. They're tired of the division. Okay? And um, they, they read the Bible like this. Okay? They are shaped heavily by reason, rationalism, um, two main philosophers, some of them you may know, um, John Locke, another one named Sir Francis Bacon. It's a very good name. Um, they were taught to read the Bible like the Constitution of America. Okay? So what is the Constitution? What is the United States Constitution? Huh? Yeah, so it's we the people. So it is a it is a law. It's law, right? Constitution is law. Right? So um so you would so Alexander Campbell, shaped by his dad, read the Bible as if it was like a law book. Okay? So um uh, let me let me be a little more clear. He explored the Bible as if it was discrete facts waiting to be revealed in Clear, logical patterns. Uh, Campbell believed that beliefs could be attained and derived through sound and objective studying. So when you hear words like sound doctrine or New Testament patterns, you've heard those growing up, that's very Campbell-ish. Because that's how he read scripture. He read it like a law book. He said, you know, there are evidence and there are facts, and if you just follow these series of evidence and you follow these facts then you will act, you'll be able to gain some insight and truth out of Scripture, right? And so that was Campbell. So the Bible is the blessing of who we are, and it is probably one of the main ways that we identify ourselves, right? I mean, that's, we call ourselves the Bible people, um, and that's awesome. But we also know being a Bible people, that's also what created Conflict and division. Um, even in my little bit of time period, I'm 38 years old, and the divisions I've seen, almost always uh, the division, there's more than two sides, but just simplifying again, usually both sides of the division say what? That they are speaking where the Bible speaks. You ever notice that? Right? Um, so uh, pick the issue, but... Um, a big one right now is gender, right, and, and churches with women. So ironically, uh, churches who are being more gender inclusive, they're, they're doing it not because of what the Bible says. They're doing it because they're saying this is what the Bible is telling us, right? And then people who don't agree with it, they're saying what? No, the Bible is not saying that. So what do you do with that? I mean, what do you do when you have two people who are claiming God's word is telling them what to do? And yet, they're coming from different opinions. Right? Who's right? Well, I am. Right? And the rest of you are wrong. Um, I'm teasing. Okay. So, uh, Thomas Campbell. Um, he's the older, he's the dad. He, uh, he was really against, they all were, but he was really against creedal statements. So, did you ever grow up in Churches of Christ? Oh, you grew up in Church of Christ. You remember being against creeds? You know what creeds are, like the Westminster Confession of Faith or the Nicene Creed. These are things that churches or denominations wrote up and said, these are kind of the basic belief systems that we have. 
So the reason why, though, the reason why they're against him wasn't just not because of what was in the creeds, but what the creeds represented. So some of these creeds are written very nicely and have some good language. They weren't necessarily against the content. This is what they were against. So like, for example, they're against the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is what the Presbyterians focused on and read. And the reason why they were so against it was because they said if you follow this specific creed, then you are essentially saying that everybody else who doesn't follow this creed is wrong. And they didn't like that creeds divided churches. So some churches went to this creed, others went to this creed, okay? So when Alexander Campbell and Barnstone, when they say, hey, we want to just get back to the Bible, we want to just get back to the heart of the Bible, they weren't just saying it to say, let's find some facts and truths. They were also saying it because they truly believe that if we all just got back to the Bible, that that would unify all these different types of churches, that we don't need these creeds, that we can just simply read scripture. Okay? Now, sadly enough, ironically, um, that, that idea, and, this, and so Thomas Campbell at one point, um, in specifically talking about creeds, he says, look, and y'all remember this phrase, or some of you do, I just want to do this. I want to speak where the Bible speaks, and I want to be silent where the Bible is silent. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I, I 100% agree, uh, believe that Campbell would agree with me on this. He wasn't saying that phrase for us to use it for all things. He was saying that specifically related to creeds, right? What I mean by that is, is that's, that's a very loaded phrase that any of us could use any time we don't want to agree with somebody, right? And that's not what he was doing. He was using it specifically for creeds. Does that make sense? So I think we have to be careful sometimes with some of our church slogans because there's a background story to those church slogans, and they're very important, and they're very much part of who we are, and they've shaped us. But we also have to be wise and discerning and careful in how we use them and mismanage them. Okay? Um, so I, I needed to bring that up. All right. Um, so one of the temptations for us, and it's related to this motto, is that because we are a Bible-only people— that sometimes this has become more of a source of division than a source of unity. For example, um, I told you last week that there's a number of streams in our movement. One of the streams in our movement um, is non-Bible class churches. Um, and so um, there is a stream of churches of Christ that do not believe in Sunday morning Bible class. Okay. Um, and that's a different one. Yeah, you have one cupboard. So the, the, the non-Sunday morning Bible class, um, when that division happened, one of their reasons for it was, this is what they said, and it's on record, is they said, once you decide to institute Bible class, you will eventually teach families and parents that it's not important for them to teach God's word in their home and that they just wait to do it at church. Now, is there some truth to that? Yeah. Um, but what happened was, was on both sides, they both used the Bible to prove their point, And there wasn't much conversation. They couldn't listen to the value and importance of teaching Scripture in home. And the other side couldn't t listen to the value of instructing and teaching in the context of a church community. And they went their separate ways, and now if you go to a non-Bible class school church, it's just completely different than us because we have just, it's been so many years removed. Um, we, we just think and talk and, and theologically understand Scripture and God so differently, all because, again, of what the Bible or the Bible did not say. Okay, so arguments, conflict, real division occurs over... What It occurs over what we might believe is essential in Scripture, what we might believe is non-essential in Scripture, what we might consider is timely or timeless. What I mean by that is, is um, you might hear a phrase like, well, that was then, but this is now. Or you might hear a phrase, well, 
They said it, um, so if they say, I believe it, or therefore I'll do it. So um, not even looking at both sides, not even looking at the context situation, just kind of, you know, and so what we would call that growing up was, um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't call it really good Bible study. I, I would just call it topical study. Like I have this idea of what I believe Scripture is saying, and then I'm going to find as many Bible verses as possible to back me up. Right, and so I might sound good because I give you fifty verses, but how how do, in the world is First um, Peter chapter five verse thirteen? How is that even related to Isaiah forty two verses twelve? Except for they both might have the word light in it. I don't know. I was just making something up. Okay, so um, and so you have to be careful of all that. Um, Barton Stone, he comes in contact with Bible owned Christians. And his first uh, contact with Bible alone Christians were called separate Baptists. And separate Baptists were a, an interesting group. They placed emphasis on immersion in baptism. They placed emphasis on communion and among other ordinances within the church. And so they separated themselves from kind of the Baptist movement who either did quarterly or every other communion who believed in baptism but didn't believe it was essential. And so the separate Baptists removed themselves from them. Um, and I don't even know if there really is a separate Baptist movement anymore. Um, he was also against creeds. Um, but this is where I like Barton Stone. Um, he felt creedal statements were created by particular denominations. And so like the Campbells, he thought creeds further excluded people from the greater unity in the church. And so, but the difference is, is where the Campbells felt that um, Scripture should be read like a constitution with discrete facts and evidence, Barton Stone was a little different. And he felt the New Testament was more like a family guide. Like, you read it to learn about God's family, and this is in God's family. You learn how to live and work together, and not in spite of your differences, but because of your differences. So there's two ways to look at unity of Scripture, right? One way of unity of Scripture is to say uniformity, meaning here are all the facts and the truths, and let's all align with these items. And then there's another way of unity, which is there is no way we're going to be able to agree with everything, so let's just try to figure it out. And that's a messy version, right? And I would say Stone was more on this side. I'm probably I'm, I'm giving you my own subjective um, opinion. And I would say Campbell was more on this side. And I would say for Southern Churches of Christ, mainline Churches of Christ, um, traditionally speaking, in our DNA, we become more Campbell in that, right? Um, right, wrong, or indifferent. All right, I'm going to pause for just a second because I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, so let me read a couple passages, and then let me ask you some questions. Um, Timothy, in the book of Timothy, Timothy is against false teaching. And there are a couple times in Timothy where he brings up God's word. And so, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, For everything created by God is good. And nothing, nothing is to be rejected, provided it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by God's word and by prayer. Okay? So, uh, let me ask you this. Do you believe that scripture is inerrant or infallible? Good. Okay, so you have to be careful with that word inerrancy, right? So, what does inerrancy mean might be a better question. It's a loaded question, I'm sorry, but teachers are allowed to do this. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, your version, I mean, I don't, many people may not know this, Joe, so I'm just going to say this, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but um, translations are what they are. They are translations, right? Um, and so every translation has a group of people who get around together and doing everything, and they're, most of them are good. They're doing the best they can in translating the Bible. But to be fair, almost all of those translations are represented by particular institutions and we all know that all institutions have their own biases. And so, for example, the King James Version, right? The King James Version, the first, the first edition, um, the one that I'm talking about in the 16th century, was written by the Anglican Church or the Church of England, right? And they wrote it because this became a substitute of reading Scripture in worship. So when they wrote the book, they, they wrote it as if they were going to read this in, in the context of worship. They weren't writing it for good Bible study. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you what they did it for, right? And so that's why when you King James Version, it's this strange language. It's beautiful language. 
And this beautiful language was meant to be heard orally. You know, listen to this beautiful language read in the context of worship. Now, they also kind of subtly change words like divorce and stuff like that for the, with the help of the king and um, some of their issues they had with, um, with the Catholic Church. And so that's all politics. So to be fair, yeah, so I think translations do have a part in that. Absolutely. Okay, so how can you take it to the bank if you believe on errors? So I think the question is, well, what do we mean by errors, right? Or what do we mean by inerrancy? Um, and that goes back to um, age of reasoning. So um, the ancient people who wrote scripture maybe necessarily did not think scientifically, right? Uh, let me give another example. When you go take a history class today, you're learning about facts and dates and how many people died on a battlefield and when the general, what year he was born and what his favorite food was. And so a lot of facts, correct? Um, uh, what the ancient people, they weren't as necessarily interested. They, they thought facts were very, very important, but to them equally important was the actual message. So for them, the truth was the story, the message in the story, right? So like, uh, let me give you an example for scripture. Uh, when I w- took a New Testament class at grad school, you know, AC, you know, they, they, they warp your mind, you know, that crazy institution. So when I took a class at ACU, um, I, I, I found out immediately or learned that in Luke's gospel, you read that Judas, uh, how does Judas die in Luke Acts gospel? Fa- he falls and breaks his head open, right? In Matthew's gospel, how does Judas die? Hangs himself. So a rational thinker may say, well, maybe there was this tree that was hanging on the side of a cliff, and, and the rope broke as he died, and then he fell off the tree and hit his head and broke his head open. Anyone ever heard that before? Okay. Um, so is it error or is it fault? Which one's true? Is it Luke's or is it Matthew's? And the answer is yes. Right? So I'm not trying to create any chaos, um, but that would be an example, I think. He died. Right? He died. And he was not a, and he disobeyed God. And, you know, there's lots of stories. And he sold, he sold you know, Jesus off. And, yeah, yeah. See, do you understand what I'm saying? So that, that would be an example where you would go, huh. Um, yeah, yeah, so scripture, and, um, and so who came to the tomb first, um, did Peter go first, who went into the tomb first, what were the women's involvement, yeah, there's, um, and, uh, some of them, some of the gospels, uh, we're just picking on them because that's probably the clearest story to us, um, John's gospel is all over the place, right? So don't follow John if you want chronology because like he, his stories are like beginning and end. you're just like, okay, and we have like Mark and Matthew and Luke are a little more succinct and then you have some stories that happened early on in the beginning. How many, how many uh, people did Jesus really feed? Did he feed 5,000? Did he feed 4,000? I mean, come on, you know what I mean? So um, there's all these stories uh, that happen. And so unfortunately... Um, in the 1920s, especially across America, you have the rise of fundamentalism. And I say unfortunately because in some ways we are, we are somewhat fundamentalists, meaning that we also want to say we take scripture literally, but we aren't really the ones who, to Church of Christ aren't really the, the pioneers in the fundamental movement. The real pioneers, and I wish Shauna was here because I know she has a background in this, um, was the Pentecostal movement, so or the Holy, Roll, Hol- Holy Roller movement, or the Charismatic movement. So um, there's a lot of other groups who claim that they read the Bible and the Bible scripturally or literally, and yet how they practice it or how it's manifested or how it's revealed is way different. So, for example, in Scripture... Um, does it give you permission to speak in tongues in Scripture? The answer is yes. So for some groups, that means that you ought to be able to speak in tongues, right? In our worship service, do we practice the speaking of tongues? No, we do not. So how do we justify it? Well, again, 
growing up, we might have said something to this effect that there are some gifts that God said can still exist, and there are some gifts um, that no longer exist. But the danger of that is what? Is that, okay, which ones do we get to pick exist and which ones don't? Does prophesying still exist? Because according to Paul, that's the greatest gift, right? Um, all of us can at least agree that love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that gift should at least exist. Yeah, Glennon. Okay, good. So um, you, you, you've just given a very good, rational, sound, reasoning answer, right? And, but I will say this, kind of just be devil's advocate for a second, not that I agree with me on this, um, but you're speaking primarily from Acts, right? So in the book of Acts, they're speaking foreign languages, yet in 1 Corinthians, it is heavenly babbling. In fact, Barton Stone, whose Church of Christ he said when he went to the Cane Ridge revival of 10,000 people, he heard lots of babbling. And he said, even though I'm not a babbler or I don't bark and speak in tongues, he goes, God's spirit was definitely moving in those situations. Not that I agree with it. I'm just trying to be a devil's advocate. Um, that's just my job to create chaos. So, um, all right. Um, let's keep going because I, I really still want us to figure out how we're supposed to read scripture. And... We may not be able to. Okay. Um, so let's skip ahead. Um, every stream in, in our movement has argued that the Bible is the authority for the church and that application of that authority, um, but the application of that authority, and this is my point, runs at a very wide spectrum where some people are very liberal, some people are very conservative, and you have some people who are in the middle, right? And even in this room, I would say there's a wide spectrum. Is that a fair statement to make? Um, and so we have to figure out today how we're going to kind of walk through that. And because I don't think most of us in here are cool with the spectrum to some degree, but not that cool with the spectrum. Does that make sense? So eventually you might get uneasy with certain types of people, right? And that's just the humanness of us. Okay, so today in 2017, let me jump ahead. There has been a shift in the way we think about Scripture and Churches of Christ. Not everybody but, uh, and again, I can't get into the complications of the why, but there is a, a people are moving away from reading the book as a constitution, okay, as a law book, and reading scripture from a different perspective, right, wrong, or different. And this is more like this. So it may be something like this. People are now reading it more as a guide, or like a spiritual guide. Or people might be reading it more as a diverse record of acts uh, by God throughout history. Now I'll say this. I think there are parts in scripture that should be read as law. In fact, the first five books of the Old Testament is called the law. Um, but I don't think all of scripture should be read like a constitution. For example, how can you read, the consti how can you read um, Psalms like the constitution? How can you read the book of Revelation like the constitution? You just can't. Those are books of images and art and poetry, right? And that's when you get into lots of trouble. So let me say this about me so you kind of know where I'm at, um, so you know what kind of preacher's preaching to you. Um, I can't necessarily tell you, tell you exactly how I read the Bible, okay? I just can tell you that I'm reading it. Except this, that my primary aim is to witness how God is moving and has moved and worked throughout the messiness of human history. That God always offers grace and reconciliation and is always constantly pointing us to the story of Jesus Christ. That God made himself available to walk on earth, revealing to live our lives. So scripture gives us insight in how to live out our lives and how we can be a part of the kingdom of God. That the point of scripture is even for us to die on the cross. That suffering is an important piece of the life of a Christian. Because also that someday, and even in your confession, and even in your um, salvation, even in your baptism, that you've been raised again, so that you can fully participate in the eternal resurrection that we call salvation, and that you can fully be in the presence of God, as you might have saw at the Garden of Eden. And so like Stone, I deeply desire for us to be a, a faith community that follows Scripture deeply, that values it, that falls in love with it every time you read a story over and over again, that we seek out the facts and the evidences, that we read and learn the background. Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone were smart people. They, Alexander Campbell uh, woke up at 4 in the morning, and from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., 
all he did was Greek and Hebrew. So he might have been laity or kind of a priesthood of all believer guy, but he was a very smart priesthood of all believer that took his studying seriously. In a society in 2017 where we are bombarded with so much information, where you could get on Google and just affirm a popular opinion or belief, I would say more now than ever, it takes very smart, intelligent people to see what God is doing and what God is up to in Scripture. That it takes real studying, it takes real stewardship to engage in God's holy, reverent word. I will say this about the Middle Ages. When Scripture was inaccessible, when it was big and expensive and written, do you know how reverent Scripture was back then? Incredibly so much to the point where they like, were even afraid to touch it. Like it was like, like the story of the ark in the Bible. Where today, the Bible isn't as reverent anymore. You have millions of different versions. You have it in your phone, your iPad. You have it on paper. You can, put, you can get it in a youth form. You can get it in a child form. You can get it in a soldier form. You can get it in an athlete form. You can have it in different types of colors and styles and leathers and trims, gold, silver. You can put your name on it. This is all great stuff, but the entire industry of the Bible, in some ways, might have tempted us to see that the Scripture isn't as reverent as it used to be. So, like, for me, when we read God's— I like it when David Maltby and others do this, but when we read God's Scripture and the church stands up in unison and hears God's Word, that's so cool to me. Because we're acknowledging the reverence of God's holy word. Um, all right, so we have four minutes. So the last 30 years, even in Bible, um, the world has advanced greatly. And advancement is good and bad, right? Is, is technology a good thing? Yes. Is technology a bad thing? Yes, right? So advancement's not good. It's not bad. It is what it is, okay? So even when it comes to reading Scripture, things have advanced in the last 30 years, okay? So what I learned at school um, in my MDiv program is different than what Jerry Leverett learned in his MDiv program when he went to school, okay? Um, For example, okay, I get it. I get it, guys. Um, For example, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were uncovered in the 50s, but weren't really made available to the public until recently. And we learned a lot about Scripture with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Authorships, and what's real and what's not. And I'll just tell you this, there's been a lot of things over the last 30 years that have challenged, you know, who wrote what, when, how, who wrote what. I mean, even like common thing, common sense stuff in Scripture. Did Moses write the first five books of the Old Testament? How can you? You died. You can't write something when you're dead, right? Um, And yet, we traditionally said Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. How would you write Genesis, Moses, if you weren't around at God's creation? So there's things like that. There's small things. Literary criticism. Um, Literary criticism is a form where you you go into Scripture and you read it, or any type of uh, literary work, and you read it from a different lens. Okay, so for example, um, right, wrong, or different, people think this is a bad word, but I'm going to use it anyways. Feminism, you've heard that word feminism before? So um, a feministic reading of scripture, they would obviously focus on which characters in the story? Women, right? So um, to be fair to that particular critique, I was not introduced, really, to how many women are involved in Luke's gospel until somebody pointed that out to me. I I did not know until probably in the last five years, and I grew up in church and went around, I did not know that that Jesus' ministry was financially, um, was financially, was financial because of the women. The women are the ones that supported Jesus' ministry. And that says that in in the Bible. But I've read that a hundred million times and never knew that. And so that's just one example. Um, and I have this book. I didn't bring it, but there's 13 different literary forms of criticism in this one book I read alone. Which I'm saying is there's lots of ways to read and identify Scripture, whether it's historical criticism, looking at facts and history, whether it's looking at it through the lens of particular characters, whether it's looking at it. So all these different things have shaped. Okay, Churches of Christ in the Bible today. In my opinion, 
it is very important for us to be unified as God's people, which means that when we discern and read Scripture, we do it together. I do, think it's, I do think it's true that there are some people who have studied and learned a lot, but we should not take away from one of the DNAs of us, which is the common person, that anybody can read Scripture. Because even though I might know some Greek and Hebrew, um, there have been people who have read the story of Jesus in the jungles of Africa and have radically changed their life as a result, right? So let's not limit the access to Scripture. Um, with that in mind, I, I ask these questions. How do we discern and decide today what is timely and what's timeless? How can we respectfully and honorly and civilly and in unity study difficult topics? I know for me personally as a preacher, I avoid difficult topics with like a 30-foot pole. Because um, I, A, uh, this is my livelihood and and I want most of you to like me. Um, I'm okay with some of you. Um, so who has ultimate and final authority in the decision of Scripture? Do the elders? Do the preacher? Do you? Um, who, I mean, who's the one that says, this is what, the, this is what God is saying to us? I, I don't really have an answer for that. These are just questions. Um, and so all these things to me are so important. And this is the final thing that I want to say is one of the one of the wonderful things about Churches of Christ is our love and value for Bible, the Bible. And we cannot lose that. In fact, I find it somewhat of a tragedy. That's just not our young people, but I find it somewhat of a tragedy that a lot of us are having a hard time, maybe that's the best word, entering into God's Word in a very habitual, exciting way. That we're tired, that maybe we're lost, that we're burned out. And, and I hope as a church we can redis rediscover and get excited about what God is up to in Scripture. That God is blessing us in incredible ways. And that's God's living testimony. That's God's witness to the history of the world. And so let's not lose that. Even if that means a little disagreement. Even if that means a little tension.